Hello! Hello, hello, how is everybody? What's going on? Welcome to our final discussion of The Great Gatsby. Our first discussion of The Great Gatsby as well. Um, give me one second. <laughs> so, uh, how is everyone? What's going on? What do we think of this book? Great to be back. Awesome. Get my notes ready. I like to hear that. A little warning, some members can't attend because of the time change, so it's a little earlier than usual for us. Oh! Yeah, I'm in Chicago now, so I, I um... I know it's an hour-ish earlier than I normally do it. You do not like the book. You don't like it! Okay. I will say this, when I first read it... Um, I'm obsessed with the book, Watch the Movie in 2013. When I first read it... I was obsessed with like the largesse that you see with how Fitzgerald brings us in to the 1920s, which in the United States was like this, and I think a lot of the world, not a lot of the world, some of the world saw this as well, but the US was known for this huge boom, the stock market, wealth was something that anyone could have. This, this idea of this American dream where you can change social classes and, and change your entire circumstance. I mean, we the world had just experienced the Great War and people were coming out of that disillusioned by the society that was present before looking for a way to kind of like what's gonna what's next and I thought that was sick but now reading it I do admit it's a very sad book I really struggled with it initially I was caught up with Anne's warm world and couldn't adjust to the cynicism of Gatsby very very contrast to Anne uh, I mean I think in retrospect, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting choice to read Anne of Green Gables and then go straight to The Great Gatsby, but I don't think we would have done that otherwise, so I think that's a, a pretty cool thing we get to kind of look at it from, from almost that lens. Um, like the story, relationship between characters seems fake, superficial. Catch and Mosher, that is a great... Uh, that's a great... Oh God, it's not that time when my mind doesn't work, is it? Observation. That is a great observation. That's one of the comments that's happening. The, the realest moment that was in the book when it comes to relationships or love is when, when Nick Carraway says that he almost loved Jordan Baker, but kind of, but not really. He recognizes that it was something, but not really. That's like the realest thing. Everything else is, I mean, Gatsby doesn't really love Daisy. He loves the idea of Daisy, and he wants to possess her, and that's what drives him throughout the whole movie, the whole movie, <laughs> the whole book, and the movie. The movie, I I love the movie too. If you guys haven't seen it, um, I think it does a great job with this book. Uh, yeah, I I actually personally love Leo DiCaprio's version of this movie. I think it's fantastic, but um, but yeah, I didn't like it because I didn't like the ending. I'm pissed at Daisy, the girl I cannot handle. Daisy is not only the, my least favorite character in the book, I think she's one of my least favorite characters ever. Because of how, like... But this is also just, a, like, it, that's part of the book. They're trying to show you that this... One of, the, one of the themes that we've discovered in this book is this class divide. And, and just class divisions. And you see that in many ways. We see that when we look at the West versus the East, like... Both of them came from the Midwest. All of them did. Tom Buchanan, Daisy. Well, yeah, Tom Buchanan, Daisy, and then even Nick Carraway moved to the East. And then you see it in East Egg and West Egg. East Egg, I believe East Egg is where the old money is. West Egg is the new money. I think. I might have it backwards. But, you know, they, they have a separation there. They have that. And then you hear the way that Tom Buchanan talks about it. He is not cool with this class division, and he doesn't want to lose his circumstance. Or he doesn't like the idea that other people might be able to attain it. So he keeps this class division between that new money and old money. They're just all bootleggers and swindlers. And at the end of it, 
Daisy doesn't take a chance with Gatsby because she doesn't want to lose that the class which she's a part that Gatsby will never be a part of that upper class old money thing <laughs> I didn't read it just now because I was catching up on Handmaid's Tale for the next one but I'll join because okay love the jazz age the story is on the summer of 1922 on the roaring 20s and the tale of the American dream exactly Maddie McCall so like I said the roaring 20s were this incredible time of prosperity in the United States for people that could really quickly change their financial uh, financial circumstance and their and in doing so hope to change their class circumstance hopefully that that's what the goal is and it's, it's not really achievable I mean even the way that they describe the Buchanan's house versus the way they describe Gatsby's house like the Buchanan's like this the white dresses and the flowing curtains are so tasteful clean and Gatsby's just all of this um, ex like I don't know if exuberance is the right word. Just this extra stuff, all of it, to prove to everyone that walks in that he has money, and to prove, to prove all these things that the old money people don't feel like they have to prove. Uh, Gatsby didn't get rich with stocks. No, we did find out that through Wolfsheim, Meyer Wolfsheim, Gatsby was a bootlegger and did things illegally. Uh, so yes, partially stocks, I'm assuming, but also partially selling alcohol at that time. Remember, in the United States. In 1919, the alcohol prohibition started, which many would say was the rise of organized crime. When alcohol was no longer legally obtained by its population, the people of the country looked to illegal means to receive their alcohol. It never stopped. Actually, the prohibition caused a spike in alcohol consumption in the United States. Actually, some of the biggest like gangsters we know about, like Al Capone and stuff, were famous bootleggers, and that's how they made their money. So, like, it's commenting on this time that not only was there this huge class mobility happening, this, this, all this money coming in and people were just, I mean, one population of the country, the other population of the country was like severely suffering, but like this one population was getting really rich really quick. There was also this other population capitalizing on this now illegal substance that everyone still wanted a piece of. So it's, it's, it was like actually a really crazy time. The 20s are really dope. Um, do I think Simon would like this book? Yeah, absolutely. I think Simon would actually... Yes and no, maybe? I don't know. That's, that's actually an interesting question. I think he would recognize, it's, like, recognize the cool parts of it, but also recognize the fakeness of people. Um, I had no clue for the first few chapters, but I eventually got into it. Yeah, the first few chapters really do a lot in setting up the world that we're going to become a part of, right? It's Nick Carraway describing his life in some small ways. It's one thing. we don't. I don't know if we can ever really trust him. I know he keeps telling us, I'm the most honest person you'll ever meet. I'm the, I'm, I'm, my true flaw is my honesty. You know, like, I don't know if we can trust him. We're still seeing this whole book through his eyes, not through what's really happening. He's the narrator. You know, we don't have... Um, like this omnipotent figure telling us what's happening in this book and we see these characters. We have one person, Nick Carraway, bringing us into this world and telling us about his summer of 1922 in New York when he met this incredible Gatsby. But, um, so yeah, we do have an entrance where we come with him into this world and he is the person telling us, all right, from what I know, there's a divide. There's the old money in East Egg, the new money in West Egg, New York, everyone's making money in bonds and stocks, so I'm going to try to do that. Another kick into the theme of this, like, look for that, that financial success in the American dream that you can change classes and circumstance. Nick Carraway felt prey to that too, although he was from an upper class family of the Midwest. So he was technically with this, you can tell in his like reserved nature and the way he speaks with people and things, he was from that other, like, world I guess but so then it brings us into the Buchanan's when he's meeting his cousin Daisy and and Tom that they'd known back in college and all of these this world he enters there and finds Daisy again and kind of describes us to her or describes her to us and then eventually we meet Gatsby but only at first through what other people have said which I think is cool because I feel like that's how everyone meets Gatsby they meet him through finding out that he may have killed a man. They meet him finding out that he's actually the son of some Raj somewhere, some king, or he's some prince, or, you know, the Duke of 
Ecklenburg, I think I, I don't remember which one it was, like what, he, what, what it was there. But and then finally we meet the man, and even then we don't really meet him until he eventually tells, you know, Nick Carraway tells us the truth that he hears from Gatsby much later in the novel. Um, I miss Anne. Yes, I miss Anne as well. Um, Daisy needs a serious, serious wake up call. But Daisy fell prey to, and also this one thing that I think is very interesting because we're seeing this theme echoed a lot currently as we go into the. 20s in the United States, this idea that, like, um, I lost my train of thought, give me a second. Well, if there's, like, this, I don't know, I, I lost my train of thought. There's supposed to be fair-sounding relationships. It's Nick's subjective point of view. Right, exactly. But that's the thing, we're still reading Nick's subjective point of view. Which I think is cool. We're not hearing anything that is. We can't trust anything to be 100% true. Anyway, this book was sad, but I've enjoyed it. The writing style made me think about Anne, the solemn style. It's amazing. I will say some of this writing is some of my favorite writing we've read. I mean, the imagery and, and the way he describes things. I mean, I, I feel like you can open any page and read something incredible. Um, right. We have the green light. I think it symbolizes the power of a dream. I mean, Gatsby has this dream that he's going to marry Daisy Buchanan and then they're going to live this life together. And he literally pursues financial success to a means until he feels that it's good enough for her. And then he enacts this plan where he has his neighbor bring, you know, like he waited until he felt that he had enough money to be worthy of her. Um, like that whole, it's just crazy to me that Another thing that I thought was interesting, it's, it's crazy that they describe him as like this, or even like in the analysis that I've read, they've been like, he's so loyal and this, I'm like, really? He sounds like obsessive and creepy. Daisy moved on, Daisy got married, and this guy still like, I don't care, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win her as if she's an object. Like he treats her like a possession, like people do with their money. Something to be won or obtained, and it, it, it's a very, unsettling thing, but then Daisy doesn't mind being seen as that, I guess. Also the green light, the color of it, like the money, green. Yeah, and the money, green. Tessa's here, she will not be joining our live. Okay. She has things to do, but she she is here with us. <laughs> um, this book is not a love story. No, it is not. It's really weird because I loved it when I first read it the first time. I managed to enjoy it by the end, though. Yeah, I loved it the first time, and this time I I see, I think, past the glitz and glam of the 20s, and I see these real relationships. I see how terribly unhappy these people are, and how what they're actually searching for, monetary success, uh, I keep saying that, but like, things, and not real people. I mean, no one's really that great of a person in the book. Jordan Baker is an, you know, an alleged cheat and thief and golf and Gatsby has no real stories but Gatsby's the one to tell us uh, Jordan Baker she would never do a thing that's wrong I'm like well now we know we can't trust both of you guys I don't know interesting yeah Nick was half in love with I'm falling behind on these comments guys so I'm kind of just Gatsby loves the dream of having Daisy with the green light and everything yes but I think Reading this book is really sad. We don't get to meet these characters and see the warmth in Daisy's voice and see that that smile, that famous Gatsby quote about his smile, which is, I think, one of my favorite descriptions of a smile. Um, in the movie does a really great job of bringing us into that world. So I have to say that um, if you feel like you didn't like the book, check out the movie. Some people did have problems with it. I'm not going to say it was a complete... 100 people loved it most but I know I did I enjoyed it very much I thought it really brought what the book speaks of these giant parties it really brings it it really is like this is how big Gatsby was willing to go think about it dude had hundreds of strangers over just for the hope that Daisy would walk in one day so like craziness The, the Lerman movie makes Daisy too sympathetic. Hmm. I'm going to watch it today, so we'll see. We'll see. I'll comment on that next time.
I thought the characters were morally, bran- uh, were morally bankrupt. Well, that's one of the things that this era was kind of talking about as well. This, this former society and its morals, uh, with the way that people can get fast cash and, and, and like party, that, that society was trying to take a, a step away from that. And that's one of the things the book was commenting on, this, how society was kind of falling apart. Daisy has so many sides to her. I have a hard time hating her. I can't stand her. I think Daisy's a product of a patriarchal society. Possibly. I mean, she talks about how being a girl it's, at that point, she, she wants her daughter to be a fool and she won't have to worry about things. Um, Daisy's probably the worst character I had the unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate to read. Like, what the hell? She was a mess. She was a mess. West Egg is the new money, right. Okay, the girl needs smack upside the head. Everything she did was so superficial. All right, I'm skipping. Are you sick, bro? I'm a little tired, yes. Daisy's a mess like her husband. I'm not sorry. I think Daisy was also oppressed by Tom, so I think it's part of why she didn't end up leaving him. He intimidated her. (laughs) Also, what's up with this? Like, Tom can go cheat on Daisy a million times and just be kind of an asshole, but uh, Daisy does it, and it's like this whole thing. He loves her. He does... But literally not a year they were married, dudes gets in a car accident that gets in the newspaper and the woman he was with breaks around. Like, Tom, come on, don't be that asshole. And then it just proves that it's all about possessions. It's not about Daisy as a person. Daisy to these men wasn't seen as a person. Frankly, I think the only person that sees her as a person is Nick Carraway. Everyone else sees her as this object that they can attain and, and then because of them owning her will have some value. You know? Why do I always have to pin the book title? We all know what book we're talking about. You're hitting all of my talking points when I teach this book. Good! <laughs> my research was good. Hold on. Gatsby. Damn it, we always do this too, right? Take forever to try to pin it. Oh no. Oh god. There we go. Got it. I felt horribly sad for Gatsby in the fact that no one showed up for his funeral except his estranged father. But then again, that's what that kind of speaks to, like that whole divide. Gatsby never really gained any anything real because it was all in it was all just a pursuit of something else. He made one real friend. Everyone else was just blurred by their quest for more, their quest for money, their quest for wealth and, and, and status. I mean, all of the criminals he was working with were going for their own uh, enrichment, right? Like, wealth-wise. Daisy was part of this upper-crust world where they could, like he says, which I think is a beautiful quote, when he says, like, they just go back to their money and hide. Tom definitely is a definition of an asshole. Bookless reader, I don't think she was seen as an object by Gatsby, but she was, be- like, he talks about that in the book, too, when, um, when they finally have the big confrontation in New York, where Gatsby's like, she's running away with me and she loves me. The way that, one of the analyses I read talked about how it wasn't until after that when she chose Tom again and said she couldn't say that she didn't love Tom, because she did at one point. Gatsby sees her as like the real, what he's actually seeing for the first time, not this idealized version of who this woman was five years ago and who he continued to believe she was until that moment. Like only until then did he start to kind of like lift the veil of like, oh, I'm being completely played here. This girl's never going to leave her husband for me. Exactly. Daisy was like the Holy Grail. 
He pursued her for his own end, like an object, not like a person. Um, it's so interesting. Um, pinning successful, it took forever. Uh, yes, and you can really notice what we just talked about, uh, really notice that when we were speaking about Daisy, when she was in the room, when Gatsby and Tom were talking about her as if, you can't tell her what this, I love her this way. She was like a child. Nick trying to have Poole in the funeral and then appear, it's really sad, but at the same time it shows us that Nick has a heart and maybe the only person who liked Gatsby for who he was and not for his money. Money doesn't buy friends, exactly. And then so many people pretended to care about Gatsby only when he hosted parties, but when he died, only two people showed up. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, even his dad was concerned with the material wealth Gatsby acquired at his funeral. He's talking about his achievements. G Daisy saying, I loved him too, is what crushes Gatsby, of course. Start reading between work weeks so I can share my opinions. I feel so lost right now. I'm just listening and reading on with everyone's opinion. If you have the same edition as Alberta, if the book was the cover, uh, the book cover was the most celebrated piece of art in American literature. It's a disembodied eyes and mouth over the blue sky with the image of a naked woman reflected in the irises by Francis. Oh wow! I didn't know that. Hey, look. Haha. <laughs> Tessa just bought me coffee, I'm kidding. I went like this and then I was like, huh. <laughs> Magic. Magic. Um, that made me sad. Gatsby ended up being alone when he died. Even if Nick was there, it didn't matter because all he cared about was Daisy and she literally left him to die. Yeah. Do we read any scientific literature, psychology, or anything like that? No, not yet. We could, though. I'm not opposed. Um, all right. I'm glad you guys did research. I did research, too. Um, so, yeah, I was just... Now we can get away from some of like the less technical things and just talk about, generally, things we liked, things we didn't. One of my favorite things is... Hold on. I'm going to read this page because this page is my favorite. Ready? I'm Gatsby, he said suddenly. What? I exclaimed. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I thought you knew, old sport. I'm afraid I'm not a very good host. He smiled understandingly. Much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with the quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in life. It faced, or seemed to face, the whole external world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. It understood you just so far as you wanted to be understood, believed in you as you would like to believe in yourself and assured you that it had precisely the impression of you that at your best you hoped to convey. Precisely at this point it vanished. And I was looking at an elegant, young roughneck, a year or two over thirty, whose elaborate formality of speech just missed being absurd. Like, the way he talks about a smile. I love that. Um... I love the fashion in the movie. Yes, love the fashion in the movie. 
Oh, the description of the billboard advertisement. Yes, love that. Um, Stephen King, I'm thinking about bringing him into the lineup, to be completely honest. So just hold on, because we're going to talk about the next few books um, at the end of Handmaid's. Or probably the first week of Handmaid's Tale, so you have time to get them. But you're not Handmaid's, sorry. The Testament. The next book. But we'll talk about that in a minute. We have time. Um... Gotta bounce. Heading to the 49ers game. I'll watch the rest later. Thanks for picking this book. Have fun. Enjoy the game. Good luck for your team. One of the best parts of the book. Yeah. I love that. I just opened it. But that's the thing I loved about this book. I feel like I can open a random page. And, and get some like beautiful description of, of like life. Or just the way F. Scott Fitzgerald like sees it or wrote things. Like I, I love the way he describes how like everything really. Um, I'm learning a lot about this book just by listening and reading everyone's comments. Yes, it's a great book. Nick Carraway is Gatsby's biggest stan. Yes, he is. I think Nick kept oscillating between putting Gatsby on a pedestal and hating him and what he stood for. I agree. There's something about Nick that is in awe of who Gatsby is and what Gatsby can be and in awe of the way he effortlessly plays this character. But at the same time, Nick Carraway recognizes that Gatsby's playing this character and that he's not real. But that's like the beauty of him and it almost like, I think almost can be like representative of the 20s itself. This thing that's not really attainable and not really real but it looks so perfect that you have to kind of be in awe of it and, 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 and want it to like you. <laughs> that's what I feel Carraway kind of felt in a way. He wanted Gatsby to like him. But also he did it. Like, he stood up for himself when he wanted to. He, he never let Gatsby impose anything on him. Like, he was frustrated that Gatsby made Jordan Baker ask him a favor that Gatsby wanted him to do so that Daisy could go over to his house so that Gatsby could meet her. Like, he was like, fuck, why didn't you ask me yourself? Like, this is, this is ridiculous. And then Gatsby does it. And then Nick, Nick Carraway's the good guy, you know. He sits outside under a tree when it's raining so that Gatsby can have time with his girl, like Ultimate Wingman. But then, when he's had enough of it, he's had enough of it and is like, alright, I'm going back inside. This is some bullshit. It's, it's interesting because he never gives up who he is for Gatsby, which I think a lot of people are accustomed to doing for him. And I think that's why Gatsby likes him, because Gatsby sees that he'll treat him as a person, not as, not as this thing that represents wealth or success or so different from everybody because of that. Yeah. He knows who he is, but he doesn't really know what he wants because he doesn't really want for those big things that he else. Um, can you repeat that louder just so I can hear you? Sorry. I I said he he knows who he is he knows who he is but he doesn't necessarily know what he wants or maybe just compared to the other people in the book who want so much. It's Drastically but we also see that Caraway came from the Midwest, where life wasn't moving as quickly, and, and the morality was different, and more representative of the old American society, where, where things like working hard, and, and, and like the, the, the actual society, like, moral standards are different. So he comes as almost like a representative of this old society, into this new world, literally into West Egg where new money is and is the one person that isn't awed by this immediately. He's still searching for the character and people to, to decide whether or not he likes him. I mean, he talks about Jordan Baker that way and I think that's why they on and off kind of dated because she could never achieve that other part because she was too much of this new world. She wasn't, she wasn't enough of like the old society. She was fake like all of them. And Nick Carraway is the one guy that was like 
real to the point that when this all went down, he went back home because he was like, "This is I can't deal. I can't deal with this. This was terrible for me to see that people can be this way." <laughs> like, it's actually a really fascinating thing that I think that fits. Like you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald was able to kind of layer this book in this way. Like so many things he's talking about at all times. Because I think he had a very clear idea. I mean, I don't know if you guys looked up anything about his life. From what I understand, it was similar. Fitzgerald came from a wealthy background, I think, in Minnesota, right? Wealthy background in Minnesota, like Nick Carraway, uh, went to Princeton, and Nick Carraway was a Yale man. So Ivy League school, probably paid for by the parents. And then he moved to New York City, just like Nick Carraway did, where he met Zelda Fitzgerald, <gasps> eventually becoming Zelda Fitzgerald. And she was from high upper class echelon, and she was almost like a daisy in that sense. Then part of this life. Actually, one of her one of Daisy's lines is something Zelda said hmm. about her daughter. The fool one. Yeah. So the fool one is actually a line that Zelda said about their daughter, that Daisy says. So that's interesting. So like, he very much I think recognized this, and I'm wondering why he wrote it. Like, I want to look more into that. Maybe I will, and we'll talk about that again next time. But really cool um sorry i'm behind in the comments so reading with alberto a new audible series i would i said it a million times someone's i would love to do it someone says to pay me to do it <laughs> um so we don't get in trouble with any copyright things uh Ooh, are we okay with reading crime book, crime novels, like the works of John Grisham? Oh. Just a question. Um, John Grisham novels. Yes, I've read, I've read a couple of his books. One was for high school. Uh, maybe not particularly John Grisham, but uh, crime novels would be interested. I, 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 I'm thinking of stuff that's a little more classic, like maybe something by like Truman Capote. Or, I, I don't know. But we'll uh, put that down. In a, in a week, we'll have, we'll have a list. Fitzgerald died thinking his book was unsuccessful. It didn't become really popular until after World War II. That's right. Um, they actually gave the books to American soldiers to kind of keep their morale up. And it was only then. I mean, in 1944, it sold 120 copies. Now it sells 500,000 copies a year. You know. Um... Gatsby's not real and not loved by his mysteries. James Gatz is real but alone. Nick is one confused character at times, so I'm not sure I entirely like him either, even if he claims he's the most honest person you can meet. As far as I'm concerned, most honest people I meet never have to tell me they're honest. You know? I've never met an honest person that says, by the way, I'm honest. I mean... I don't like to get political, but there's a very dishonest person in the White House right now who feels the constant need to tell us, believe me, trust me, just trust me. I'm like, well, you're telling me to trust you so much that I don't trust you. There's a famous Shakespeare quote about this. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. <laughs> Yo, bro, chill. I, I believe you. You don't need to constantly be telling me to trust you, believe you. And I feel Nick Carraway does this on more than one occasion, so it makes me not trust him. Gatsby is the symbol of the American dream, as is the green light. Gatsby represents how American dream is attainable, yet at a cost of corruption or disillusionment possible. I like that. I like the imagery, but not the abruptness of the dialogue. I was like, just finish saying what you're talking about already. <laughs> yes. Uh, Caraway's so loyal to him, ready to do everything for Gatsby, the only honest friend that has visited his house. It's clear also when he's dead and Nick takes it really personally the funeral situation. Yes. Um, Tessa, join us. Tessa's busy. Um, maybe she'll give us a wave at the end. He's an Oxford man. Have you watched The Joker? Do you think the opinion of some that this film is too gloomy is objective? Maybe they just don't understand that such is life. Um... Well, that's a different topic. We're talking about The Great Gatsby here. But quickly, I, th I think 
it's not too gloomy. I think the Joker is, is, is a study, and I, th I think it's commenting on a lot of things in society, and it's trying to bring attention to something that I think is very interesting. Also, I think as a population, we should, we need to do more to not only destigmatize mental health, but we also need to do more for for everyone. And I think that's going to get very political. But I think the Joker was awesome. It freaked me out. But we'll talk about that later. This is this is about the great Gatsby. Um, the other alternatives, the gold hatted Gatsby, or the high bouncing lover. I love that when you read other alternative names for the novel. Um, I, when I was reading it on set, uh, Christian Stolte was like, oh, the great Gatsby. Have you heard his other novels? The, the decent Gatsby and the pretty good Gatsby. <laughs> or something like that. He made like, a joke about that. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, I was really upset and angry the puppy was left to starve. I mean, if that doesn't represent the callous feeling that these wealthy have for life that doesn't technically qualify as human to them, whether it be a dog or the lower class, then I don't know what does. Like, that, that whole part of the movie is also interesting. Because I think you forget that throughout his observations in that scene, Nick Carraway is drunk. And not only is he drunk as someone who gets drunk often, he's drunk as someone who never gets drunk. So, he's in this point where the world seems to be shifting. And I think that's where he really starts to recognize the difference in the circumstance that he's in in the East Coast. Like, I think that's a big turning point in the book. Um, I don't have any real favorite characters in this book, and it's weird. Um, I, I think I like Nick Carraway. He's the only character that I think I've gotten to see his inner monologue, so I can trust him to an extent. The title of the book refers to the magicians of the time, the great Houdini. The Great Gatsby. Gatsby isn't real. It's just a fabricated dream and illusion to lure Daisy. I like Nick because he's just watching this drama unfold. Hey, he's, he's very much a passive observer. But also, like, we learn that we don't know everything. This is him just telling us what he thinks is important to the story. Um... Joker's a masterpiece, that's all, no discussion. I agree. But I also, I will say, I was disturbed by that movie. Like, I left the theater and, uh, disturbed, and it took me like an hour to kind of get back into like a regular headspace. Like, that movie affected me in a profound way that I think movies rarely do. Um, which is to speak to its, like, awesomeness. Um... I like Fitzgerald's descriptions, expressive without being flowery, I have to say. Gatsby was a commentary on society, Joker's more modern take on the commentary of that uh, on that commentary of society. In Chapter 5, the mentions of time increase and decrease whenever the pressure of the reunion gets to him. Time is another character in that chapter. When I came home to West Egg that night, I was afraid for a moment that my house was on fire. Two o'clock and the whole corner of the peninsula was blazing with light, which fell unreal on the shrubbery and made thin, elongated glints upon the roadside wires. Turning a corner, I saw that it was Gatsby's house, lit from tower to cellar. Okay, really quickly though, that chapter five is what I was talking about, how Nick Carraway's like, no, nah, I'm not about it. Um, let me read that to you guys. Uh, As my taxi groaned away, I saw Gatsby walking toward me across his lawn. <laughs> Your place looks like the World Fair, I said. Does it? He turned his eyes toward it absently. 
I, I've been glancing into some of the rooms. Uh, uh, let's go to Coney Island, old sport. In my car. It's too late. Well, well, suppose we can take a plunge in the swimming pool. I haven't made use of it all summer. I've got to go to bed. All right. He waited, looking at me with suppressed eagerness. I talked with Miss Baker, I said, after a moment. I'm going to call up Daisy tomorrow and invite her over for tea. Oh, that's all right, he said carelessly. I don't want to put you through any trouble. What day would suit you? What day would suit you? He corrected me quickly. I, I don't want to put you into any trouble, you see. How about the day after tomorrow? He considered for a moment, then with reluctance. I want to get the grass cut, he said. We both looked at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended and the darker, well-kept expanse of his began. I suspected that he meant my grass. But there's another little thing, he said uncertainly and hesitated. Would you rather put it off for a few days? Would you rather put it off for a few days, I asked. Oh, it, it isn't about that. At, at least he fumbled with a series of beginnings. Why, I thought, why, look here, old sport. You don't make much money, do you? Not very much. This seemed to reassure him, and he continued more confidently. I, I thought you didn't, if you'll pardon my... You see, I carry an... Uh, and then he goes into this whole thing, but I like how Caraway's just not having it. He's like, no, nah, dude, I'm not going to Coney Island right now, bro. It's too late. He's like, well, let's go to the pool. He's like, nah. The pool? It's, it's, I want to go to bed. It's 2 in the morning. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, I've... And I feel like most people would kind of just be like, okay, Gatsby, whatever you want. And I, I just, that was one of the highlights that I liked about Caraway. Yeah, the last few chapters, shit got crazy. Um, Tessa and I did this really cool thing where we turned off all the lights and listened to the audiobook for the last few chapters. And uh, the one that I told you about that Jake Gyllenhaal did. And it was really something. It was pretty cool to do it that way. It was almost like watching a movie, but not. It felt like we were like, People in like their 30s listening to like some sort of radio play or something. It was pretty cool. Um, I think it's interesting how the group goes through characters and tries to mark them as good or bad. Well, I think we try to see what we like in them and what we don't. In Daisy, we hate her fickleness. We don't like her. Like Gatsby was obsessed with her and, and love. I, I don't know we don't want I, I, yeah I guess good or bad is one way to put it but I think we just kind of we just judge them <laughs> oh god 10 minutes already wow I didn't even notice thank you for telling me that all right well um one second Sorry, guys. All right. Um, yeah, let's go judge people. <laughs> so much to talk about, though. Isn't that amazing, though? This was one of the shorter books we've read, coming in, I think, at 100, my version, coming in at 180 pages. And, wow. Uh, someone here wants to say hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, and I'm glad she's here, because we're going to be talking about what's coming next. So, everyone. We have just finished our awesome entrance into the 1920s with The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I put it up there as a book that I very much enjoyed. One of my favorite books that we've read together. No, didn't get it, it didn't, it, it the writing did. I love the, I love the way that Fitzgerald uses the language. I thought as stuff that we've read, it, it's right up there with some of my favorite things that we've read, read it the fastest, but at the same time, reading it again, I, it is a sad book. Um, it's hard to see when you, you see people treating other people as things and treating those things as people. It's, it's, it's depressing. Um, what? So, in terms of that, it was, it was an interesting time to read it again. And I'm excited to read it again in a few, in a few years. And yes... Athena Giordano, you are correct. 
it is now time to talk about Margaret Atwood's The Testament, which is the sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which we read not a few months ago. What? What? Didn't we read it way longer ago than that? Could you quantify that amount of time in months? <laughs> you said a few months ago. I said not a few months ago. Right. Doesn't that mean less than a few months ago? It means possibly more. <laughs> Anyways, we will be reading The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. Um, I'm very excited for this book. I don't really know what to expect. Honestly, I haven't done any research into it at all, other than knowing it's the sequel to this next book. Um, we read it last year. Okay, if anyone knows me, they know I'm not good with time. Time is very much a made-up thing. It's all an illusion, it's all relative, and that's annoying. Albert Einstein said it like this. Sit next to an attractive person for two minutes and it could feel like two hours. Of, uh, no, it could f for two hours and it could feel like two minutes. Sit on a stove and two minutes will feel like two hours. That's relativity. All right. Boom. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, anyone that knows me, I'm not good with time. So, we'll be reading this book. Let's do this really quickly. Margaret Atwood's dystopian masterpiece, The Handmaid's Tale, has become a modern classic, and now she brings the iconic story to a dramatic conclusion with a stunning sequel. Fifteen years after the events of The Handmaid's Tale, the theoretic regime of the Republic of Gilead remains, uh, maintains its grip on power, but there are signs it's beginning to rot from within. At this crucial moment, the lives of three radically different women converge with potentially explosive results. Two have grown up on opposite sides of the border, one in Gilead as the privileged daughter of an important commander, and one in Canada, where she marches in an anti-Gilead protest and watches news of its horrors on TV. The testimonies of these two young women, part of the first generation to come of age in the New Order, are braided with a third voice, that of one of the regime's enforcers, a woman who wields power through the ruthless accumulation and deployment of secrets. Long buried secrets are what finally bring these three together, forcing each of them to come to terms with who she is and how far she will go for what she believes. As Atwood unfolds the stories of the women of the Testaments, she opens up our view of the innermost workings of Gilead in a triumphant blend of riveting suspense, blazing wit, and virtuistic world building. I can't wait to read That this. sounds pretty freaking dope. Wow. That, that sounds epic. really dope. So, <clears throat> guys, I cannot wait to read this with you. We are running out of time. I'm going to give us a guesstimate as to what we should do. We're diving into this book first. So, we're going to read the first hundred pages for next week. Does that seem like too much, you think? Hundred? Yeah. Don't no, we usually, do read we usually do hundred. So, let's do a hundred. So for me, 100 pages, slightly over, is up to chapter 19. Chapter 19. So read up to chapter 19. So through chapter 18, don't read a page past 19 unless you want to. Just know that we're not discussing a page past 19. So I will see you guys all next week. Congratulations on yet another book. Really awesome. I think we read The Gatsby's like about the 20s as we're about to go into the 20s too. Kind of why I wanted to do it. Because like, think about it. In it's like, perfect to read before. I mean, in three months, we enter a new decade. Crazy. Which is pretty, pretty dope. And now we're at a place where we all are very aware we're entering a new decade. Like, the 20s. I cannot wait to party like Gatsby. But, I will... Not be mean to be people. Mean to people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I will post again later about what time our live will be on Sunday. But remember, up to chapter 19. Thank you guys for joining us on yet another awesome adventure into literature. And remember, keep questioning things, keep being curious, keep growing, keep learning, keep changing, and continue to be positive forces of change in your community. Um, recommend books to people. We just read a few really good ones. Um, yeah, and I hope to see you guys here next week. Uh, goodbye. Have a good one.